All right, good morning. Welcome to Life Bridge. My name is Grant. If we haven't met yet, as Bill mentioned, this is going to be a little bit of a different series this week and next week. And what we mean by different is I'm going to teach just like we normally do. I'm going to go through some Bible stuff. And then kind of towards the end, we're going to get laser focused on a specific application. Okay? And it's going to be like laser focused. And when we, when we get to it, you're going to be like, wow, that's really specific. And each of these two weeks, the application is kind of heavy. What I mean by heavy is it's going to require somebody that's very fanatical about their relationship with Jesus in order to actually execute this application. Okay, so very excited about this series. Hope we have some of you out there that are fanatics. Today, uh, we just want to jump into and basically define, as Google defines, because Google defines everything now, uh, Google defines what a fanatic is. A person filled with excessive and single-minded zeal. Okay. So just as an example of this, I'm I'm a Green Bay Packers fan. I know, boomy, whatever. Any other Packers fans? Oh, all right, all right, well, we've got a couple here. Okay. So anyway, I'm a, I'm a Packers fan, but I am not a Packers fanatic. Okay. When I chose to be a Packers fan, I had no idea that I was going to be living in a rival city. Okay, in the same division eventually. But anyway, that's that's what I am. I'm a fan, but I am definitely not what you would call a fanatic. And what I mean by that is, I'll watch them on TV, right? Pretty much don't miss a Packers game. I even watch the preseason stuff. But I've never done two things. I've never made myself uncomfortable in order to be a Packers fan, okay? What I mean by that is I I have never taken off my shirt, even though I have a body for this. Um, At least the Packers body. Anyway, I've never taken off my shirt and painted myself green and put a giant G on there or anything like that. I've never done anything that would, like, make me uncomfortable, right? Second thing I've never done to be a Packers fan, that know that this is how I know I'm not a fanatic, is I've never made any sacrifices at all to be a Packers fan, right? So I've never, like, bought tickets to Lambeau Field in Green Bay and flown over there or drove over there. In fact, I've never even gone down to Ford Field to watch the Packers play, right? Because I look at the price and I'm like, eh, I can just watch them on TV, right? And so I just, I've never made any sacrifices to do that. So you cannot say that I am a fanatic, right? You see these fanatics, the guys that that paint their cars, right? The guys that, that just do everything, they're just way over the top. That's not me. No, no uncomfortable, no sacrifice. Now here's where we want to go with this, and just really hear this. Many of us kind of follow Jesus like that, right? When we're following Jesus, we're, we're big fans, right? We're excited about it, and this is what happens time after time after time. We're going down the road in our car, or we're reading through some scripture, or we're, we're listening to a sermon or something, and all of a sudden, this has happened to every person in here, all of a sudden we kind of have this, this epiphany, this, this inspiration, and we go, man, man, I, I need to be or do something different. And it's something that just weighs on us, and, and we get kind of excited about it, and, and whatever that is, and then we get to this place where we realize that if we were going to follow Jesus, if we were going to like act out on this enthusiasm or this inspiration, there's two problems in our way. One, we realize that if we were to actually do this, we'd have to make ourselves maybe a little uncomfortable. Maybe it's the kind of conversation we would have, maybe it's the thing that we would have to do, whatever it is, it would it would make us kind of feel uncomfortable, and so that's kind of a strike against it. And then the second thing we think is, oh man, if I were to really do that, if I were to, if I were to go after that, and that would require a lot of sacrifice. That, that would be something that I would have to give my time or my money. I mean, it would be, it would be difficult for me to be able to actually carry that out. So this is what we do, and this is kind of our secondary reaction. Our reaction is, well, number one, I, nobody's ever told me to, to do it, right? Like, I haven't ever heard a sermon, and it's not like an angel appeared to me or anything like that. And nobody, nobody came and told me I should do this, so, so maybe I don't really need to carry this out. And the second thing is, we look around, and this is what we do. We go like this. 
We see our other Christian friends, family members, people that go to church, and we're like, well, I mean, nobody else is doing it. Nobody else is making themselves uncomfortable in this way, and nobody else is sacrificing in this way, so I guess maybe I don't need to do it. And what we're doing is this, and you don't even realize this, but what what we're doing is we're just waiting for somebody else to go first. And most of us are just kind of in this holding pattern where we are waiting for somebody else to go first. And if they went first, we'd probably follow them, but we don't want to be the person that like gets out there ahead of everybody else because we don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't really want to sacrifice that much. And there's a difference between somebody that is, that is a fan and somebody that is a fanatic. And so what I want to encourage you today is God, Jesus, called us. once. He said, believe in me and follow me. And he said, I don't, I don't want you to just kind of be my fan. I don't want you to just kind of support me with a thumbs up. I want you to follow me in a fanatic way. In Romans chapter 12, it says this, never be lacking in zeal. That's kind of the biblical word for fanatic. That's the biblical word for excited, biblical word for passion. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. In other words, if you're not excited about this, if you're not passionate about this, get that way. And get that way quick. The word zeal there, it's got a real simple definition. It's just hot enough to boil. And one of the things we want to do in this series, we want to ask you the question, what makes you hot enough to boil? What makes you angry? What are you passionate about? What is something that God has laid on your heart that you've just kind of been holding back on? And you've been waiting maybe for somebody else to go first. Or maybe you've been waiting for God to bump you over the head in order to do it. What is that thing in your life? Today we're going to go kind of a kind of an odd passage. We're going to go to uh, Numbers chapter 25. Now, I, I say a lot of times that this is my favorite passage, right? Or this is my favorite book of the Bible or something like this. But I want to introduce you to my favorite character in the Bible. And after I read this story, you're going to be like, really? That's your favorite guy? Okay, so anyway, this, this is in Numbers 25. Now, if you haven't got anything going on this afternoon, go home and read the book of Numbers. Because it is an awesome terrible story about some really horrible stuff that God's people did and God's kind of reaction to that. And it, you know, if you talk about the wrath of God in the Old Testament and fire and brimstone type of God, it all comes out, I mean, the majority of it comes out of the book of Numbers. Because there's some really dark stuff that happens when God's people are disobedient and God reacts to that in, in that book. But anyway, this book is filled with that. In Numbers chapter 25, God's people are once again going astray. They do this a lot. They go astray a lot. And one of the things that God gave, he gave them the law and the commands, and he, he taught them everything. There's this definitive right and wrong. And, and what's special about that is that God's people, the Israelites, were the only people that were doing this. Like, they were the only people that were trying to follow God in any way, and God was only speaking to them. And so one of the big rules that God gave was that I do not want you to marry people of different cultures. I don't want you to marry the Midianites. I don't want you to marry the Philistines. I don't want you to marry anybody around here because, in case you get to thinking that God's the first racist, okay? There's a, there's a really good reason for that. He said, I don't want you to marry these people because this is what's going to happen. They're going to entice you. They're going to lead you astray. They're going to lead you to their... Gods, and you're going to start worshiping a God that isn't me. And when that happens, there's not going to be much hope for you. So I don't want you to be led astray by the people that you marry. Now, one of the gods, and there's several gods, but one of the gods that the people around, especially the Midianites, one of the things that they worship was a thing called Baal Peor. Now, just a give you an idea. If you've got small kids in the room, you might want to put your hands over their ears. But um, one of the things that they did to worship uh, the Baal Peor worshipers was that they would go before this god and they would um, 
they would get down before the altar and they would uh, defecate as a form of worship. Okay? Really gross. And mixed in with that was some sexual practices and male prostitution and female prostitution. And I mean, it was just, when they went to worship Baal Peor, it was ugly. And then on top of that, some people would go in and they would, um, they would eat things that had been given in worship. Okay? Yeah, so just extra sketch, extra sketch, extra sketch, right? Get that out of your head. Just wanted you to know, these are some really bad people. Now, pick up in Numbers chapter 25. Numbers 25, it says, verse 1, while, the, while Israel was in Shittim, the men began to indulge in, I know, I can't say it, but, uh, <laughs> indulge in, you know, works with Baal Peor, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the men began to indulge, I was going to just blow past that, but I can't. Uh, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality, with Moabite women. So they weren't even married, but they were just engaging in sexual immorality. Who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. Now remember what I just told you. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to Baal of Peor, Baal Peor. And the Lord's anger burned against them. Now it says they yoked themselves, or they became attached to. This is the same terminology used in other places of the Bible that talks about like this, this marriage covenant. In other words, God's like, hey, you're yoked with me, I brought you out of Egypt, and you're my people, and I've given you my truth, and they are committing adultery on God by, by getting enticed with these women and following after and sacrificing to these other gods. And so God's anger is burning. Just like your anger would burn if you're married, if you found out your spouse was cheating on you, you would be very angry, both at your spouse and the person that was cheating on God's anger is completely justified here. God's very angry with them, and, and this is what God does. He sends a plague on the entire nation of Israel. Now, we don't know much about what the plague was, but we know it was kind of a quick death because people are dropping like flies. And God's trying to get their attention and say, hey, this, this is not okay. You guys better turn from this. You better repent. You better figure this out. So this plague begins to destroy the people. Verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. In other words, like God said, okay, go get the leaders, go get the people, round them up, and you're going to have to kill all of them. And when you kill all of them, my anger will turn away from you. So Moses said to Israel's judges, or, or Israel's like kind of key leaders, each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. So that's God's strategy. If you go and you kill all these leaders, the people that are, that are going first, the people that are leading my people away, if you kill all of them, then the plague will stop. Verse 6. Then an Israelite man brought into the camp a Midianite woman, right before the eyes of of Moses. So Moses is before this great assembly and, and he just gets done with his big speech and all of a sudden a guy walks in with the very woman that's going to lead him astray, this Midianite woman. Right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of me. So they're bawling their eyes now. They can't believe this plague has come. They can't believe their nation has been led astray. And now, my favorite character in the Bible. This is a little harsh, and this is a little gross, but this is what he does. Verse, verse 7. When Phineas, son of Eliezer, uh, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly and took a spear in his hand. Uh, and Adam followed the Israelite into the tent. He drove the spear into both the man, both of them, right through the Israelite man and into the woman's stomach. 
Then the plague against Israel was stopped. But those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. So, in other words, this whole assembly is happening, and everybody just hears the words of Moses, and then this guy just brazenly walks by with this woman, walks into the tent, and everybody stands there, right? They know what they're supposed to do, and everybody's just sort of standing there thinking, well, what do we do? Do we have a conversation with the guy? Do we go knock on the tent door and ask him to come out so we can politely, you know, talk to him about what he's doing? But Phineas, he knows exactly what he needs to do. He picks up a spear, and it's a little gross, but while basically they're in the act, it appears, he goes and rams a spear through both of them. Boom! My favorite character in the Bible. Why? Because he didn't need to think about it. He just needed to act. He knew what he needed to do. He didn't care what anybody else thought. He just did what he needed to do, and he didn't hesitate. Now, one of the other reasons he's my favorite character is because God also finds great pleasure in what Phineas just did. Now, listen to what God says. The Lord said to Moses, Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites. Well, that wasn't the plan. The plan was for them to round up all the leaders of these people and kill them. But because of Phineas's one act, God's anger was turned away. It says, since he was a zealous for my honor among them as I am, I did not put an end to them in my zeal. Therefore, tell him, I am making a covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of lasting priesthood because he was zealous. He was heated to the point of boiling for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. Now, here's, here's the point I want to make. Somebody that is a fanatic goes first. That's what a fanatic is. That's what Phineas did. He went first. Because that's, that's what you do when you're passionate about something. And God looked at his zeal and looked at his passion and he said, that's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of thing that I want to see in my people. And because of that, that's going to change my mind about everything. I'm going to change the whole plan. I'm going to hold back the, my wrath against my people because of his passion. God wants that same kind of passion from us. And the only thing holding us back is that nagging part of our brain going, oh, that'll make me uncomfortable. That'll cause me to sacrifice. I don't want to have to do all of that. And whenever that nagging feeling comes in your head, I just want you to remember that God, God saw the passion of Phineas and God will see your passion as well. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to be stupid and make a lot of mistakes. Right? If you go ahead and go forward and you're passionate about something, it's going to be a hard road to plow. But you just need to see how much God honors that kind of passion. Now, like I said at the beginning, where I want to go with this is I want to go very, very specific. This is a specific application that only somebody that is very passionate, very zealous, I'm very committed with, with entertain and doing something like this, okay? So here's where we're going to go with this. We would like you today to consider adoption, right? You're sitting out there going, yeah, that's the obvious application of this passage. Ram a spear for a guy or consider adopting a child. It's all the, it's all the same thing. No, we would like you to consider adoption. Now, here's why this is a big deal to just me personally. I, as many of you probably know, I adopted. Um, I have two biological children. I have two children that I adopted. I want to show a picture of them just real quick so you can. I know I paid Zora Wall yet. Um, so the two on the left are my biological children. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, two on the right are my biological children. Now we got Elijah, Megan, Nevaeh, and Josiah. These these are my kids. And I got to tell you, when I had those first two, I was done, right? That's it. No more kids. The house is full. The Bible says happy is a man who has a full quiver. My quiver was full of two. Um, and then God started just really working on my heart. 
And we met a family in our church that we were attending in Missouri who had adopted these two beautiful little girls from India. Uh, and their names were Shabri and Shakira. And we just, that just wrecked us. We kept looking at them and we're like, why, why can't we do that? Like our kids, for some reason, are turning out all right. Maybe we should introduce, introduce more kids into the home. And I first thought, what do you think? Well, that's uncomfortable, right? That, that's going to require a lot of sacrifice. And I started coming up with kind of every thought in the world as to why I shouldn't do this. And i got to tell you, I'm not the example of a fanatic. I wasn't the one that went first. There were several other people in the church that I saw that, that kind of went first. And then they're the ones that inspired us. And today, just very specifically, I want to encourage you, if you're sitting out there and you have the ability to, I want you to ask you to consider adopting for a couple reasons. First of all, because it's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a responsibility of those of us who follow Jesus. In James, uh, he tells us this, that this is pure religion. This religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless. It's this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And he is really specific there. He's like, that's, that's our responsibility. That's our job. If you want to honor God, if you want to authentically have this religion, not just sort of this outward stuff that you do, and that's sort of a practice, you want to honor God, take care of widows, and take care of orphans in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Another passage in Matthew, Jesus says, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf, welcoming me, God's like, I am that little kid. I am that little kid without a mom, without a dad, somebody that's been removed from their home. That's, that's me. And if you welcome them, you welcome me. And God needs people that are passionate about welcoming him into their homes. Now I want to show you a, a, a gap that God, through these verses, that God has called us as followers of Jesus uh, to fill. I want to show you a couple of graphs. This is all this is all Michigan stuff here. And I can't tell you how many times I hear people talk about, oh, you know, overseas missions, that's good, and that's good, and that's good, but, but we got problems right here in our own backyard, and, and so many of you have said that to me. That is absolutely right. How are we going to fix those problems? They're really difficult to fix. Let me show you where we can really step in as fanatics for Jesus and fix it. Three to 5,000 children every year await adoption. Every year await adoption and do not end up getting adopted. Now you got to understand, these are kids in Michigan who have probably been removed from some incredibly difficult situations. Situations maybe some of you are familiar with, but the majority of us have no idea what it would be like to be in that situation. They've been removed from these situations and they are waiting for somebody to love them unconditionally, to lead them, to be their parent unconditionally. And they wait, and they wait, and they don't ever get adopted. Second graph. There are 400,000, almost 400,000 children in the foster system in Michigan. That's a big number. 400,000 kids, again, kids that have been removed, kids that just don't have what they need. And here's the number that, that should scare us. Only about 30,000 of them end up actually getting placed in a home. Right? The rest of them end up in group homes, classified as a home with 10 or more kids in it. In other words, they're somewhere, and they're living indoors, and they're getting fed but there are hundreds of thousands of kids who do not have what they need right here in our backyard in Michigan. And the foster system is a little broken, right? But they are begging for somebody out there to take these kids into their home and show them love. And that responsibility, that responsibility falls on the back of people who claim
claim to follow Jesus Christ. And so what we want to ask you to do today is to genuinely consider, pray about, and think about adopting and, and for life. Okay, not just for a little while, not for six months. This isn't a little commitment where we ask you to volunteer in the children's area or something like that. We, we, we'd like to ask you to bring somebody into your home and to love them and to care for them and to show them the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, the question I want to leave you here with today, when you walk out of here, I want you to be able to answer, ask this question of yourself and I want you to be able to answer it. The question goes like this. Why not? Okay? That's a question. Given the verses about, you know, taking care of widows and orphans, we've got to sincerely ask ourselves as Christians, why wouldn't we do this? Okay? Why not? And there are some reasons why you shouldn't. Okay? So if any of you are, like, trying to figure out if this is right for you, let me run through some of these just real quick. There are some reasons why you wouldn't. If you've got an unhealthy marriage or family, okay, if, if there's a situation where you're in and, and your marriage is just, like, on the brink of disaster, adopting isn't going to fix that. And you probably have heard the horror stories of adoption before, and you've seen the bad things that happen. And, and yeah, trust me, when we first started adopting, everybody was quick to run up and tell us about every disaster, right? Well, I had this friend one time, and he turned into the, and they adopted a kid. He turned out to be a psychopath, and like I think he's in the uh, in jail right now. And you know, I'm like, oh, great, it's fun. A lot of times, uh, adoption goes wrong. When, when a child is introduced into a family or introduced into a situation where you're trying to kind of mend the broken marriage, that just, it just isn't going to work. Uh, look at your home honestly and ask that question. That would be a good reason to why not. Second one on there. Poor motives. Okay, I'm just going to give you some poor motives. This first one really is my least favorite motive among adoptive people, and this happens so much. Financial gain. People jump into the foster and they're like, well, I pay you, right? I gotta tell you, I didn't find out that they like paid for stuff until after we were already all the way down with that. I, was, I thought this whole thing was gonna cost me money and, and you know, she eats a lot, but it's, it's, anyway, so anyway, it's financial gain. That's a, that's a terrible, terrible reason uh, to adopt. Second, you're bored, right? This is not something, you do. if you're bored, go on vacation. Right? If you're bored by an Xbox One, okay, don't, don't adopt. Number three, uh, unhealthy codependency. Right? If you've got this like problem, and, and you're just like you need that hole in your life to be filled, and that won't work. Because if you adopt, you you are not filling the hole in your life. You are filling a hole in their life. You can't use them kind of for that purpose. And number three, and the final point here, you're unable to provide for the children either emotionally or financially. Now, emotionally, totally get. If you're off your rocker, don't adopt. Um, financially, I don't mean that you're going to be able to put all your kids through college, right? I don't mean that you're going to be able to do everything that they ever wanted for them. I'm just saying, if you have enough money to feed and clothe them, then you've got enough. If you're unable to do that, then, then you shouldn't. And as I go through this, I tried to be real thorough with this. That's like the only reason that you would have to not. The only other one would be, I just don't want to. Right? If, you, if you've got a healthy marriage, if, you, if your motives are pure, if like you've got emotionally the ability and you've got the finances to it, you really don't have a reason to not do this. The need is too great. And so again, today, just very specifically, we want you to consider adoption. We want to give you kind of an easy next step. Uh, I'm going to be in the back at the information center after the service is over. And Bill is uh, going to be up here too. And, and Bill, uh, he has just recently or is in the process of adopting um, their daughter Chelsea through the adoption uh, thing. And so he and Heather are going to be in the back as well. We would love to kind of help you with that easy next step. We would love to help you and coach you and do whatever we can to, to do uh, this conviction issue. Let me pray for you.